wanted to say that it's been a pleasure to share the course this year with Carla Lamb, and she, of course, will continue the course next year, so the course isn't dying. And I think as an indication that it's worked well, I did all of the stage one toots this week, and they were all very lively, some of the best that I can remember. So if that's an indication of the success of the course, it was very successful. Now you'll recall that we have just finished A.J. Ayer, and in a sense he brings moral and to political philosophy in the English-speaking world to a close. That is, he embraces ethical skepticism. He says there's no higher truth about good and evil, uh, that ethical assertions are just sophisticated expressions of emotion. You will remember he's an emotivist. And he says when you say that something is good, that's just like saying charity hooray. And when you say that something is wrong, that's like saying Hitler ug, is it not? Uh, that there is no cognitive content to moral assertions, and uh, that we can elucidate our political ideals, we can stell them out in practice, but when we're faced with an opponent who doesn't share them, all we can do is agree to disagree or agree to fight, one of the two, or agree to politic. Now I'm going to try to convince you that that is false. I happen, as many of you know, to be an ethical skeptic, and I'm also, like Ayer, fundamentally an empiricist, but it is simply not true that once you say there is no higher court of appeal that we can take Nietzsche and ourselves to and get a judgment as to which ethical system is in accord with truth. It's simply not so that that's the end of the matter. I believe in no higher court of appeal. I don't believe I can appeal to scripture as an arbiter as to whose ideals are best or Plato's world of forms or Aristotle's concept of human nature or Mill's proof of the principle of utility. I think that all of these are defective. But I think that even if you reach skeptical conclusions about ethical truth, you can have a very lively moral debate based on what I call the agenda. Now the agenda is something that everyone has to accept because the prices of not accepting it are too great. Even if you are Nietzsche, you have to accept the fact that if your moral system is loaded with logical incoherence, that's a black mark against it. After all, if an ethical system is not coherent, you don't know what you're buying into. If Nietzsche made one moral judgment one day and a contradictory one the next day, we would have a right to say, well, he is not effective as an ideologue. Uh, what am I buying into? He tells me one thing one day and one the next. Any thinker has to say, I am happy to face the consequences of my ideals in practice. After all, if someone holds a particular ideal and we get the impression that the only reason they can cling to it is shutting their eyes to the consequences of acting on that ideal, again that ideal is sunk. You don't need a truth test to say that that ideal is bankrupt. And then finally, Every ideal has to have a social dynamic so that it could design a livable human society. Unless we want to be like animals dispersed in the forest, we have to live together with some type of unifying glue. And therefore every political thinker has to argue, well my set of ideals could teach human beings to farm a civilized society of some sort. And so these three weapons we can use in an agenda. Now that agenda only gives you half a loaf. If you have up your sleeve a truth test, you can win one big victory. You can say, well, the Bible vindicates all of my ideals and it condemns abortion or it condemns vivisection. And if only people had faith in God, they would all give up their false ideals and accept mine. The moral agenda for moral debate can't give you that. I think that once truth tests fail, ethics is mainly a matter of commitment. You either internalize very deeply humane ideals or you don't. I think I can show, as I tried to do last time, that Nietzsche has no plausible social dynamic, that he is at times logically inconsistent, and at times does not realistically face up to the consequences of his ideals and practice. But none of that gives Nietzsche a good heart. 
That is, that shows that his particular ideals are very circumscribed. But he could still say to me, okay, I have no plan for a United States of Europe ruled by supermen, and you are the only ones who can organize a coherent human society, but you cannot forbid me as a matter of private ethics to be a parasite on that society. And you cannot prevent me from being an aesthetic elitist as an individual who ignores humane values. Uh, I'll be a painter, uh, I'll live off of your society, and as a great painter, if I have to kill someone to get the money to paint, I'll do it. So that type of victory I can't give you. That is, I cannot make Nietzsche love humane ideals if he doesn't do it anyway. I mean, this is why everyone wants an ethical truth test. You know, in science, if you show that Einstein is right and Newton is wrong, then everyone ought to embrace Einstein. You'll have unity. The agenda for moral debate, debate may undermine the morale of our opponents, which I think is quite worthwhile, taking the wind out of their sails and undermining their morale. But I cannot say to them at the end of the debate, you ought to be humane. That has to come from within. With that preface that I'm offering you half a loaf, let's first look about the distinction we drew earlier, about three lectures ago, between analytic and synthetic. Now there are a number of propositions that philosophers have isolated that are not neatly classifiable in this way. I'm going to ignore those because they don't affect what I have to say today. Even though there are propositions that may sit on the border of this distinction, there are other propositions that clearly fall on one side or the other. And sometimes you can make people more coherent about what they say purely through the use of this distinction. I take it we saw that analytic propositions are merely propositions like pure mathematics that use words consistently with logical consistency. And they are not propositions that can establish facts about the real world. If I say there's a yellow balloon floating in the hall, you can sit here and reason logically from now until doomsday and you can't test the proposition. It's a synthetic proposition and you have to go out and look. That is, it can only be tested against experience. An analytic proposition would be something like a triangle has three sides. If you deny the truth of that, you deny logic. I mean, if you say it has four sides, we can say to you, well, surely you mean a square, don't you? You can't mean a triangle. But we have to keep that distinction in mind because people in moral debate often ignore it. You'll sometimes hear people defend Christianity by saying, you know, you say, well, read Homer Smith's Man and His Gods. You know, there have been more people killed by Christians butchering one another than probably any other force in Western civilization. We talk about the Roman arena and all the Christians that were thrown to the lions, but when the Christians took over the empire and fighting over who should be Bishop of Adrianople, they killed more people than were killed in the entire pagan history of the Roman arena, to say nothing of others who were killed about the true date of Easter and so forth. And you say, you say the Christian church has been an influence for good. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And you'll get the answer, but no true Christian would have done that. Well, that of course is a mere tautology. You're saying, I won't count someone as a Christian unless they behave humanely. Fine, that tells us about your ethics, but it has nothing to do with the historical record of Christianity as an institution, does it? It's like saying if we were all Quakers, there would be no wars. Well, that's true. If everyone was a pacifist, there'd be no wars. Unfortunately, there have been Quakers like Nixon who have started wars. Uh, so it has nothing to do with the Quaker church to say if we were all Quakers, there'd be no wars. A church is a historical institution that has to be judged according to historical criteria. Uh, sometimes you run into a student radical who if you point to the hard hats in America that voted for Reagan, he'll say they aren't real workers. Well, up to that point, I thought I knew what a worker was. They were someone who earned their living with their hands. And hard hats are certainly workers in that sense, are they? But he won't count anyone as a worker unless they also have a revolutionary psychology. Well, I take it that again as a cheat, is it not? 
You can use words in that eccentric way if you want. You can say, I won't call people who work in coal mines 12 hours a day workers if they vote for Reagan. Fair enough. But it has nothing to do with our actually understanding why the working class is split between liberals and conservatives, does it? And it does nothing to exonerate that portion of the working class that, like Disraeli said, were angels and marble. Disraeli was the first one to say, you know, we Tories can get a big working class vote if we only play it right. Though Bismarck had the same idea, didn't he? Uh, so you can see then that the use of tautologies to exonerate your favored group as a historical force is simply a logical mistake. Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. Now, there's another use of tautology, a misuse of logic, in which we try to monopolize something positive for people we favor or monopolize something negative for people we don't like much. We had a race relation counselor in New Zealand a few years ago, someone may remind me of his name, who said Maori by definition could not be racist. Uh, was his name Hirsch? I think it was. I think it was. And he said that they couldn't. And they asked him why. And he said, well, many people say, that's of course wonderful evidence, that many people say. Many people say that no oppressed group can really be racist. Well, you think about that a bit. I mean, assuming a Maori uh, lynched a Chinese New Zealander for dating his daughter, he can't be a racist. Uh, we, it strikes us as odd over here. Of course, that depends on your definition of racism. I mean, if you're exactly. Raci your definition of racism is simply having a, a you know, a unhealthy view of, of another race. Of another race, then that's fine. But if you view, ra if you view, you know, if you view your definition of racism as a system of oppression, exactly. then no, an oppressed group can't. You can be try racist. and make a distinction between institutionalized racism and personalized racism, can't you? Yes. And in those senses, you can. But when you're drafting legislation, presumably you do want to give some protection to people who might be victimized by an oppressed group, might you not? I mean, I think it's uh, uh, arguable that the group that oppressed the Jews most enthusiastically in uh, Germany were the lumpen proletariat. You know, I mean, the demoralized workers who are out of work. And I'm sympathetic with them. But that doesn't mean I don't call them anti-Semites. They were. They weren't in a position. They were manipulated by other people institutionally, weren't they? As long as you think clearly, there's no problem. I don't think Hirsch was thinking clearly. You know, I think that he was essentially saying, you should never demean a Maori by saying he's a racist. If all he meant was Maoris don't control New Zealand, and therefore their racism is relatively harmless, and that they can't institutionalize it, well, that's a sophisticated statement, isn't it? And we would have to look into it. We might say, well, maybe they can't institutionalize racism, but they can sure institutionalize sexism on the Marae. You see the point. So you can't exonerate a group just by playing with words, can you? You have to do an analysis of reality. Uh, I have on occasion heard people say, no male can be a feminist. Well, there was at one time in this institution a young gentleman, I won't identify him by name, who thought he was a feminist. And whenever people would picket beauty shows, he would be the first on the picket line. And if you were supposed to bite a policeman on the ankle, he would be the first one to take a bite. And he drove the feminists crazy because they actually, they grew to hate him because they felt, you know, no man can be a feminist and why is this guy giving us such a hard time? You know, he keeps behaving as if he were a feminist. Well, here we have to say, is a feminist someone who lives up to feminist principles, in which case he was a feminist, or are you just having a tautology that no matter how much like a feminist someone behaves, I won't give him that accolade if he's a male. Now, we wouldn't normally do this in other circumstances if only because it cuts your clientele. It essentially says males are beyond the pale. No one has ever said you have to be gay in order to be a socialist. It would be quite counterproductive. You could say it, of course, and we would say, well, this person certainly uses the word socialist in an eccentric way, 
and there's nothing logically incoherent about it, but then you wouldn't build a very strong socialist movement, would you? You've artificially restricted your clientele. Now sometimes a feminist will say, no man can imagine the oppression that women actually feel. Well, that's an empirical assertion that we can test. We could say, well, is that so? I uh, often, sometimes a woman has said to me, no man can imagine like what it is like to be raped. And you think for a minute, and you think, what about all the guys who go to prison or, and are homosexually raped? You know, men are raped, and I can vividly imagine what that's like. I don't have any problems of imagination. Uh, it's, you know, it's an assertion which is at least an empirical assertion, but it can be falsified. I mean, it's crazy to say that no man, can a man imagine what it is to be insecure on the street? Well, if like uh, I was when I was a kid, there was the biggest bully in school out after me and you had to scamper home from school every day to avoid being beaten up, you can't imagine what it's like to be insecure on the street. Uh, these then are efforts to make the world simpler than it is. Certainly it would be nice if no blacks in America were racist, but some of them are. Uh, it might be nice if all men could be easily classified as the enemy, but unfortunately or fortunately some men actually have been pioneers in the feminist movement like Victor Debs. And away we go. One of the uses over here. Sorry, I'm just, um, in this case you're clearly stating that two minorities can in fact um, be against each other and they shouldn't be, Are they, be yes, that, that they can't be against each other and that it's about the detail that one goes into. Yeah. Uh, it can either be simplified by a person who said it or it can be um, this simple. Yeah, racist is no longer useful here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you might say Every Maori has a right to hold a grudge against Pakehas, and that's not racism. But certainly every Maori doesn't have a right to hold a grudge against Chinese, you know. So you, you can, you're now in the real world. You're now making useful distinctions. You're not just using a word to sort of set up a private country club that only certain people are eligible to join. Back here. But again, I mean, the, like you said, it, you said that, you know, if you make these distinctions based on what's useful in the real world, if you actually do believe that uh, men, ca if, I mean, if your belief is that men cannot contribute to the feminist struggle, or that a straight person can't contribute to the um, queer rights struggle, then in that case, you know, you, to you at least, you're actually making a use That's practice. a different thing. I think it was tacti tactically correct when blacks took over leadership of all of the uh, civil rights groups in the South. Now, of course, historically, there was a reason why whites. I was a core chairman in the South. And the reason I was a core chairman, that every black in my town was under the thumb of a white employer. And for me to be the front man, I, until I was bounced at the end of the year, had a secure job. They would have been reduced to starvation, you see. But once you had cultivated a black leadership, you know, you'd raised enough money to have black organizers, you could then do away with whites in leadership positions and have blacks that people more easily identified with. And I saw no racism at all in that. That was an arguable position, wasn't it? You know, these, these are not the crude sorts of things I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I think it's perfectly sound to say there's something pretty odd if males were head of most of the feminist organizations. And there's something pretty odd if whites are the heads of most of the black protest organizations. And these are questions that are based on facts that we can test, can't we? Now, if you say to me, however, that blacks can only learn in school if they have black teachers, then I'm going to want some evidence, aren't I? Because we have excellent evidence from New Orleans that one of the most effective schools in educating black kids from underprivileged backgrounds are run by Jesuits, most of whom are white. Presumably one of the reasons they are so effective is that they don't stand any nonsense and have good discipline uh, and things of that sort. So you see what I'm saying. Test it against the real world. If it comes out right, then it's a verified synthetic proposition. And then it has applicability. 
What about putting logic to work in other respects? Uh, here we come down to the fact that you have to be logically coherent in your political and moral ideology. Let's take something like animal rights. I once supervised a student who was doing an honors essay under me on animal rights. And uh, I, by the way, am not an animal rights advocate, but I was interested in helping her with her position. And one of the things she said was that it was wrong to spray mosquito larvae because that was the thin edge of the wedge. You know, it's true that mosquitoes may cause malaria, but who are to we to say that we're more valuable than a mosquito? And uh, soon, you know, you let them start spraying mosquito larvae and then they start experimenting on cats and dogs and away you go. So I asked the obvious question, what about human larvae? You know, if it was wrong to kill unborn mosquitoes, what about unborn human beings? Uh, you have to be logically consistent here, don't you? You know, and she was a feminist who believed in a woman's right to choose, and this of course sent her into something of a psychological dilemma. Uh, that is, she, she, and I pointed out, I said, are you a vegetarian? Well, she wasn't. And I said, well, if it's wrong to kill animals for medical experiments, what about killing them for something as trivial as eating them? Uh, shouldn't you be a vegetarian? She did become a vegetarian. <laughs> uh, but the difficulty with the other had to be solved, didn't it? You know, you can't say it is wrong to eliminate every type of embryo except a human embryo. That seems very odd, doesn't it? You know, why should a woman have a right to eliminate a human embryo and yet no reason is good enough for killing mosquito larvae? So again, who could ex you could not take her position on animal rights seriously until she started ironing out these inconsistencies. The abortion debate is often plagued by lack of destroying, making distinctions between logic and the real world. You have slogans at work. You know, they say, well, a woman has a right to choose. It's just that simple. Well, is it just that simple? Uh, for example, uh, why does a woman have an absolute right to choose before birth and not right after birth? You know, uh, what's wrong with infanticide? Why is it wrong to kill the fetus two hours before it emerges from the womb and not two hours after? Uh, you have to find a relevant distinction, don't you? I mean, you may find one, but you have to look for one. You can't just parrot a slogan. Or again, if someone says that they are uh, uh, in favor of abortion up to the time when the infant can survive independently of the mother's womb, science can push that back to zero, can't they? I mean, in fact, we have pushed it further and further back. I mean, now fetuses survive that are, are prematurely born much younger than they used to. And we might invent an artificial womb in which an aborted fetus could survive from day one. So you see, moral propositions are serious. You have to mean what you say. If you just say them to win an argument, you often find that the real world bites you. Uh, and uh, you have to search for some other thing. What about, again, let us imagine that we did push uh, You'd say the mother then has a very easy choice. Okay, uh, she technically won't get an abortion. She'll just have the fertilized egg removed and put in the artificial womb. Now that raises an interesting question. Does she have any say in its fate? That is, in other words, when it's put in this artificial womb, can she say, no, I want it junked? Or does she, has she now lost control over it? You see the point. Now you could always say, well, you don't have to raise it. It's not inconveniencing you. You can go back to work. And there are plenty of people out there that want to adopt unwanted children. What about the father? If it is the woman can just, uh, through some minor procedure, have the fertilized ovum put in an artificial womb, why should she have more say over whether it is life is preserved than the father would? You see the problems that arise over here. So one of the problems is in this case it is actually not the um, body of the father. It's very well to say that if a father 
is included in the birth of an unwanted child, if the child is unwanted, then just sterilize them. But if that's made the law, then there's going to be a lot of protests, isn't there? Well, let's imagine that uh, we have a peculiar situation, and this child, science has progressed to the point where the fetus is never in the woman's body. In other words, is that really the important distinction? You see, that's what you have to ask yourself. Is that really fundamental? I think that we are influenced by the fact that we instinctively feel that women have a stronger maternal instinct than men do a paternal instinct. And if that's what we think, we should come right out and say it. You know, we shouldn't shilly-shally. Because you could imagine some method of uh, having a fetus, you know, in which the egg would be fertilized after, you'd extract eggs, you know, from the mother's body. Then you fertilize them with the father's sperm. Under those conditions, presumably, you would feel that they had equal rights. Well, it can still be done today. It's being done by Sure, IVF, so. that's right. Yeah. And all I'm saying is, why is it so important, you know, that the, the fertilized sperm is in a woman's body, let's say, for 10 days? You know, at that point, wouldn't we revert to the other situation? Be with you in a second. The other thing I'd like to make, I seem to be making problems, of course, for people who are in favor of abortion, but there are equal problems on the other side. You know, there are people who say, I'm against abortion, uh, but I'm in favor of contraception. And you can say to them, well, you know, just as it's not clear to me how it's different one hour before delivery and one hour after delivery, why is it so different uh, one second before the sperm is united with an ovum and one second after? You know, if you're going to talk about potential life, contraception is preventing potential life, isn't it? Now, you can always say, ah, but only when the sperm and the ovum are together do you have a unique individual in the offing. Well, you don't have much of a unique individual in the offing, do you? And this, of course, would mean that if you take that case, you would have to ban the morning after pill, wouldn't you? In other words, you'd be trapped by your logic. You'd have to say, well, I favor all forms of contraception except the morning after pill. All I'm trying to do is to show you that sloganeering on complex moral issues and defining your opponent out of existence is a shortcut. You really have to look at these things in the context of the real world and think through what you really believe. Now, what I really believe, frankly, and I know that this is a, 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 a fudge, and often that's all we can do in ethics is a fudge. Uh, I think that a woman should have a right to abortion on demand up to the point where the fetus in the womb becomes seriously resembling a human being. Because at that point, there are a lot of problems for the hospital staff, aren't they? You know, they perform an abortion and they have to throw in the wastebasket something that really looks like a tiny human. And at least that's a distinction you could count on. You know, science will never change that as a line. And I don't say that abortion should be wrong after that. I merely say that there ought to be more serious reasons than just not wanting the child. You know, that you've fallen out with the boyfriend that fathered it. And now the idea of having his child disgusts you, whereas a month ago it exhilarated you. I would say, well, something ought to be a little more important perhaps than that. Now, I'm not trying to foist that distinction off on you. I'm merely saying that at least it isn't a distinction built on falsifying reality or playing with words. Back here. Of course, like, you know, you keep on talking about uh, referring back to the real world. And, but of course, like part of the debate around abortion is the fact that in the real world there is a huge power disparity between men and women. Exactly. Women ha are forced on this, on the, yeah. on, in society to have far less power than they have. And that's highly relevant because in our society, you see, I said you should have abortion on, on demand until, let's say, the fifth month or something like that, fourth month. In our society, you have to recognize that a, a woman, particularly a working class woman without good social contacts, may have tried to get an abortion and been rebuffed by physicians who are unsympathetic until the fourth month has passed. Well, clearly that social reality has to be recognized, isn't it? 
In such a case, you would have to say her right is extended. It would only be in an ideal society where physicians were neutral and where information was universally held, you see, that my line would, would work. Fact then. How do you justify affording this right to women? Pardon? The genetics of the child is shared by both the um, male and the female. You mean how can you justify what? Affording the woman the right to choose. Uh, well, you mean in this particular case? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the normal argument made is something like this. Imagine both of you had fathered a creature, and to keep that creature alive, one of you had to go on a life support system for nine months, and the other of you got off scot-free. Which of you should have more of a say over whether that creature is preserved? Compared to the contribution to the genetic structure of the child. The genetic structure is easier. It's what's got to be done to keep it alive that's not equal. For example, would you, if let's imagine I came to you and I said, there's a stranger in the hospital and uh, I know that you don't like him, you know, you don't want him around, but you can save his life if you'll only go on a life support system connected to him for nine months. Would you consider that a totally irrelevant consideration? And if you well, didn't, boy, might you be busy, because we might have a steady stream of these people, might we? Well, in this particular case, it's only my thoughts being considered. There's no other party that could also be. Well, but all I'm saying is a woman has two concerns. She's made an equal contribution in terms of genetic material, and her life is seriously inconvenienced for a long period by morning sickness, some risk of death, you know, and delivery, it happens. Uh, she has a double contribution. She has equal genetic material and some risk and a lot of inconvenience. All right, we're concerned with the child, though, not the bird in a place. Yeah, well. but yeah. even if a child is born, right, she still has to deal with the child for a long that's time. The, that's the a responsibility you accept when you choose to conceive a child. Uh, okay, if you do want to accept the responsibility <laughs> of um, conceiving a child, then because you paid half the contribution in this hypothetical situation. Yeah, oh, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to decide this for you. Yeah. I can merely say that I think you cannot take, you cannot put only two weights in the scale, the genetic contribution of the father and the genetic contribution of the mother. Now, you can feel that those weights are so heavy that they outweigh everything else, you see. But then you've got to argue a bit, don't you? You've got to render your position logically coherent. You've got to say, well, I would decide similar cases in a similar way. Now, I tried to give you a similar case, didn't I? You see. In other words, let's imagine that this, you and your sister have a sibling. Okay, there's an equal genetic relationship, right? And to save this, and let's assume that you absolutely loathe the sibling. <laughs> you know. The sibling has done you dirt every other way. Well, she likes the sibling, okay? And she says to you, well, I'm of the wrong, unfortunately, type. You've got to be the one who is connected to the life support system for nine months to save this, you know, sibling in common. You see what I'm saying? Now, you can deny that it's an analogy, but then you have to draw a distinction. You have to say, as you have said, well, neither of us performed an act whose consequences are normally the production of the sibling, okay? Right? Uh, now, that raises an interesting question. What if, when you had sexual intercourse with this girl, you, uh, through being careless, used a defective condom? That is, she had every right to believe the cautions had been taken, and you irresponsibly actually didn't take the proper precautions. Let's assume we um, afford rights to both parties. That, um, the only logical way we could resolve the issue if there's a conflict would be through the courts. That's, that's well, the, the courts, but what are the courts to decide? That's a cop-out. You're the judge. It's not a cop -out, no. Okay, it's well, now we, we, we've taken it to court, and you're the judge. What do you say? I'm the judge. I haven't got the criteria to wait. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at any rate, let's go on. <laughs> now, another way in which you have to be logically consistent are on things about cultural relativism. 
Uh, it's interesting to me how often I've heard people use this in a partisan way. Uh, they'll say, you know, Maori have a perfect right to accuse us of injustice. And then if someone comments on sexism on the Marae, uh, there was an interesting study that showed that there was a high correlation to the extent to which Maori tribal groups or iwi had been influenced by European values and the extent to which women were allowed to talk on the Marae. And you might say, well look, traditional Maori culture isn't all it was cracked up to be. Only when it's diluted by European culture do you have women giving a fully acknowledged position. Now you can always say behind the scenes these women manipulate the family, but I take it most feminists don't like that argument much. It was used in Victorian <coughs> times. Admittedly women can't vote, admittedly they can't do these things, but boy do they have terrific power behind the scenes. Um, now some people will say we have no right across cultural lines to criticize Maori. Well, that, I presume, means they have no right across cultural lines to criticize us. That is, if we can't accuse them of sexism across cultural lines, they can't accuse us of injustice across cultural lines. Now, frankly, I think both of these accusations are in court. I'm just saying, if you're going to say you can't criticize across cultural lines, it cuts both ways. You can't give one group, for some reason, a right to criticize across cultural lines and deny it to the other group. Vulgar racism is an example of where we can use logic very effectively. By a vulgar racist, I mean someone who says all blacks ought to be exploited, work in mines, do manual labor, not vote, whatever penalties they want to levy. As R. M. Hare pointed out, the simplest way to put logic to work with such a racist is to say, well, imagine I sneaked a pill in your food that turned your skin black. Uh, now do you deserve all of these unpleasant things? Now they might try and weasel. They might say, well, it's only people born black. To which I would say, well, your wife is pregnant. Imagine I sneaked a pill in her food so that your child is born black. Now, this makes the racists either heroically say blackness is the only human trait that counts in a human being's worth. Well, if they say that, we can ask them some very hard questions. For example, what would you think of a book reviewer who said, today read this book because the dust jacket is colored black or white, and then the next day say, oh, I'm sorry, the publisher put a black dust jacket on it. This book is no good at all. We would say, for heaven's sake, certainly what you look for in a book is style and character and, you know, a, a, a plot. Uh, the color of the dust jacket, you mean this book, the dust jacket changes color from day to day and that has something to do with whether it's a good book? Uh, in other words, you're forcing him to say, no, it's not just black skin, it's the characterological traits that are inevitably associated with black skin that render these people permanently immature intellectually or morally. And at that point, again, they're in the real world of empirical evidence, aren't they? I mean, if they tell me that everyone who is black is permanently immature, I would say, well, what about Martin Luther King? Do you consider him morally immature? Or Nelson Mandela? If you think that everyone who has a very black skin is uh, uh, intellectually immature, what of St. Augustine? What of... Um, of uh, 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 Garden Parks, the great photographer? What of Paul Robeson, the great interpreter of music? Uh, what of Thomas Sowell, the great uh, ethnic historian? So again, what you have done, you have used logical consistency to make them enter the real world of debate where evidence is relevant, isn't it? So you can see that logic can be a very powerful instrument in moral debate without having some truth test up in heaven that tells us whose ideals are correct. Uh, we can examine another person's ideals for logical coherence and we can score some very strong points off of them. Now I have put up here putting social science and economics to work because once you enter the real world often cases aren't as simple as the cases I've been discussing. They sometimes become complex and one of the messages of this course, as you know, is that moral and political philosophy are crippled unless they are assisted by a knowledge of the social sciences and economics. 
And I'll try and demonstrate that so and what I say now. Now let's assume we've left vulgar racism and we're going on to the race and IQ debate against Arthur Jensen. Uh, Jensen says, well, it's only blacks on average that have a lower IQ than whites for genetic reasons. Well, now, of course, you have to have a very sophisticated grasp of social science, don't you? You have to say, well, there's this 15-point gap between black and white, and I can give you uh, a theory as to why this can be explained in terms of uh, environmental differences between the group. And then, yo, know, you've got to defend it, don't you? Now you've got to come up with evidence, right? You've got to say, well, I can show that a disproportion of the black women are solo parents. This diminishes the uh, uh, vocabulary environment of the child. You know, rather than hearing two adults speak, it's just one adult speaking to many children and coming down to their level. You can give them Elsie Moore's study where she said uh, she studied a group of black infants, all of whom were adopted. All the infants adopted were black. And half of them were adopted by white families where the mother had 16 years of education and there was a middle class income. And half of them were adopted by white families where the mother had 16 years of education and a middle class income. At the age of seven and a half, there was a 13 point IQ differential. Now that, of course, is very important, isn't it? Something was going on in those black homes. You know, there's no genetic factor here. All the kids were black. Let's assume that, at least. Uh, but now, of course, people think you're politically incorrect. You're saying there's something about black child-rearing practices that impedes cognitive development that white parents don't have. Well, in point of fact, there probably is. And while it's politically incorrect, if you want to solve a problem, you have to look at the real world. When Elsie Moore called these mothers in with their children at seven and a half and gave them cognitive tasks to solve in common, the comments of the black mothers were almost completely negative. They are, you know better than that. You're not that stupid. While the comments of white mothers were almost uniformly encouraging. And when they have done studies in black and white homes, they have found that the verbal interaction between positive and negative is not the same. Now, if you say, that is so annoying, I don't want to pay any attention to it, fine. Then you accept the consequences of the status quo, don't you? But you see that you have to do some hard-headed social science to discuss that issue, don't you? It's not as simple as simple racism, where you can just use logic. Uh, the meritocracy thesis. Uh, this is something that we have to be involved in as people who believe in humane egalitarian ideals. Most of you want to, I presume, blunt environmental inequality. That is, you would like to mitigate the huge environmental differences that separate children in New Zealand, where some come from, have much more favored opportunities than others. And I presume you don't believe in privilege. We don't believe someone should buy their way into Harvard Med School or something of that sort. Well, the bell curve says, okay, you people who say you have egalitarian, humane ideals, you're unwilling to face the consequences of putting these into practice. You have to pray for eternal failure. Now, what do they mean by that? They say, well, you want to abolish environmental inequality and privilege. Now, if you envir abolish environmental inequality, all talent differences will be genetic. <coughs> After all, if the environment is uniform, what else could they be? And I think that even if I was raised in as enriched a society as Mozart, he did have better genes for musical composition than I do. I don't think that even with his father teaching me that I would have rivaled him. Uh, so there are genetic, there is a genetic component. Now you've abolished privilege, so all talent is genetic, and talent now has perfect social mobility. That is, talent is the only thing that counts in going to the top, isn't it? So now you can see the result of this. You will have a class system where all the successful people are genetically superior, and what is left at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale is the genetic drugs. 
That is, the people who are too genetically defective to ever rise, and of course their children will inherit their lousy genes and will stay down there with them. So here you have been crusading for environmental equality and against privilege, and it's never recurred to you to look at the consequences of putting your ideals into practice. Now I'm not going to answer this, but I will tell you now that it can only be answered by a sophisticated social science analysis. And Psych 204, I do that. And there's a flaw in the argument. There's a flaw in the argument, but it's not in the logic of the argument. The logic is impeccable. It makes assumptions about social dynamics that are quite unrealistic. But you have to know a good deal of sociology to see what those assumptions are. Let me, as a final example, take someone like Rawls. Uh, Rawls, I think, is a thinker who, like myself, has strong egalitarian ideals. And one of the things he said was that if one people have more advantageous lives than another, all that can, that can justify that is that that inequality is necessary to raise the lot of the least favored. In other words, if we allow some people to have better life circumstances and rewards than others, that may be obnoxious, but it can be tolerated if you have to do it to raise the bottom. And I presume he might mean something like, or a conservative would say, oh, I know what he means. He means that unless we had inequalities of income, people wouldn't have sufficient incentives to work hard and bring about economic growth, and without economic growth, you know, the least uh, happy people would be even worse off. But of course, to operationalize that, you have to put economics into play, don't you? Uh, you have to ask yourself how much inequality is necessary before it becomes superfluous to benefiting the least happy citizens, you know, the least well-off. So you have to actually become a reasonably sophisticated economist. You have to do the sort of things that John Pogge has done, Tom Pogge, where he has tried to supplement Rawls with economics to put some flesh on these bones, you know, because we can imagine different levels, can't we? I, by the way, think that this is an oversimplification. Let's imagine that you have two societies, and this is of the amount of inequality you can have before the inequality is irrelevant to benefiting the bottom people. If the income spread is too great, I would have lower inequality anyway. <laughs> you know, Even if it wasn't necessary to raise up the bottom, I think a society is unhealthy if there's too much inequality. You see, this is a point we have to look at. I think it's destructive of civic virtue if some people are sort of like wealthy tourists who live in your country and do not share the lot of the average person. Someone like Nietzsche would say, he's left something out, hasn't he? We don't just, man doesn't live by bread alone, there's such a thing as art. How about the enormous luxury of people in the 18th century that was irrelevant to raising the level of the lower classes, but was quite relevant to being patrons of Mozart and the arts? You know, beauty counts too, he would say, wouldn't he? Not just the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Uh, what if this inequality is necessary? What if it's even slightly counterproductive? This amount of inequality actually goes beyond what's necessary to help people at the bottom. If it's productive of great art and science, doesn't that make it worth it? This is what I call the six balls problem, isn't it? That there are actually six great goods in ethics. And it's not easily to balance them off against one another. And I'll tell you right now that if you want to find a workable compromise between these six great goods, you have to know enough social dynamics to design a society with the maximum trade-offs. You know, there are going to be trade-offs between great art and human happiness and the pursuit of truth and fairness. And balancing these things will never be accomplished by a simple formula. The best you can often do is write a piece of utopian literature like Huxley's novel Island, where he tries to balance them pragmatically. Well then, I'll end by saying that I hope you realize that this introduction to political and moral philosophy merely shows that 
you cannot be educated even in that discipline if you only know political and moral philosophy. That is, you have to be a broadly educated person who not only knows the issues that moral and political philosophy raise, but you have to spread your wings to learn some social science and economics if you're to perform the classic task of political philosophy, and that, of course, was to design the just society. Good.